So good afternoon. It's very nice to see so many people. I am the last speaker, so I must have been bad, but I'll try to make it short. So actually, just go ahead and ask me questions. We can skip the presentation. Now, I'll try to make it maybe in 15 minutes, but we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a topic that is really I'm very passionate about, which is children um, with neuromuscular diseases. So when we talk about neuromuscular diseases, we talk about rare diseases. So with all the challenges of, you know, delayed diagnosis and difficult um, symptoms to treat. And so when we talk about children with rare neuromuscular diseases, that becomes even more challenging. Um, so by now, you probably have heard uh, so much that this um, might already know um, the genetic of myotonic dystrophy. But I found in my experience that it can get quite confusing for family when they receive the diagnosis. So for children, so every um, each child of an affected parent has a 50-50 chance to inherit the disease. This is what we call a dominant, autosomal dominant disease, right? So, so far, pretty easy. So regardless of the child gender, that child will have a 50-50 chance of having inherited the, the myotonic dystrophy. So, but that child will have three possibilities. He might have just the regular adult onset myotonic dystrophy, so where symptoms usually become obvious um, well past age 18, so as young adult or adult. Or they might have two more severe forms of the disease. One is what we call childhood um, myotonic dystrophy. What that means is that the symptom starts sometimes before age 18, frequently well before age 10. So very early on in childhood. And then, um, unfortunately, some babies, they will have symptoms uh, when they're still in uterus, so be even before they're born, and definitely pretty much from day one. So that is the most severe form of myotonic dystrophy that is referred as congenital uh, myotonic dystrophy. Interesting, this uh, form, this particular form of myotonic dystrophy uh, does not affect uh, families with the type 2, but it's only um, affect family with the, with the type 1. And it's interesting to know that if you take all the people with myotonic dystrophy, um, researchers have calculated about 10 to 30 percent of all of those patients are in fact children. Um, so the 50-50 chance of having a child that is affected by the disease, but in that, in within the 50 percent with the disease, there is a chance of having um, the severely, the severe form called um, um, called congenital myotonic dystrophy. And why is that? You have already heard of this concept of the anticipation. What that is is that the occurrence of having um, increasing disease severity and earlier age of onset of symptoms in successive generation. So that, uh, in fact, you can have a very mildly affected mother with a baby that is very, very severely affected with the congenital form. And in fact, in my experience, and this has been described, that in the majority of cases, uh, when we diagnose the baby with a severe congenital form of myotonic dystrophy, uh, the mother doesn't even know that she was carrying a genetic disease or myotonic dystrophy because that was simply so mild. So the picture of, you know, having to give the diagnosis of um, in the setting frequently of, the, of a neuro ICU of a baby that is very, very uh, sick with congenital myotonic dystrophy is already dramatic enough. Uh, but at that time, actually, what in reality happens is that you diagnose the baby, you diagnose a mother, and you diagnose many other family members that were likely not aware of carrying this disease. So you know how, you know, the birth of a child should be one of the most joyful time. And of course, this become um, quite a emotional and stressful um, time. So, and this has to do with those three nucleotide repeats that extra genetic information has a tendency to become bigger and bigger as, um, as you go down um, generations. 
So once you have, once a family has a child with a congenital form of myotonic dystrophy, subsequent pregnancy are at higher risk. And, and this, I think that when we do genetic counseling, um, sometimes it kind of get lost and there is almost that um, mis, uh, misinformation of saying, well, you know, I have a muscular dystrophy and it's pretty mild, therefore, I understand that my child might have a 50-50 chance of having the disease, but sometimes the concept that in fact you might have a child that is severely affected get a little bit lost in translation sometimes, or at least that has been my experience in, in some families. So it's very hard to talk about children without talking about women, and I think that I have also passion about women who carry chronic progressive diseases because I think there are special um, challenges with that and obviously women have uh, pregnancy and so that opens up um, different challenges. So there are in fact increased risk for, um, for women with myotonic dystrophy type 1 including you know a much higher rate of miscarriages, spontaneous abortion, usually uh, preterm labor. So what that means is that sometimes the baby that is affected with a congenital severe form of myotonic dystrophy is also a premature baby. So now you're looking at the baby with, with two um, difficult challenges, a chronic genetic disease, very severe, and prematurity. Um, so making a prognosis can be even more challenging. And then postpartum hemorrhage, pl um, retained placenta, those are a common complication. Again, many of these women, they don't know they have the disease during especially their first pregnancy, and so they might not have been really monitored um, as needed for this particular type of problems. And um, um, in women who carry a child with a myotonic dystrophy, it's 100% uh, universal that they will have what we call poly polyhydramnios, which is a fancy word to say that they have extra fluid, and that's usually the first clue uh, to know that that child is actually affected by the myotonic dystrophy. These women also frequently require cesarean section, and cesarean section is basically a surgery. And with surgery comes anesthesia, and you've already heard about the potential risk of receiving anesthesia if you have myotonic dystrophy. So that's something also um, to keep in mind. So when we talk about congenital myotonic dystrophy, the most uh, severe form uh, in children, we're talking about the disease that starts already in utero, basically, before um, birth and delivery with uh, decreased fetal movement and polyhydramnios, which in retrospect, women can tell you, yeah, absolutely. I was told that I had too much fluid and um, you know, not, uh, many, uh, not much fetal movement. Uh, but this is a disease that usually requires um, a prolonged stay in the neonatal ICU with respiratory failure, problem with breathing, problem with feeding. These are babies that you can fear, uh, uh, barely um, hear them crying because their voice is so weak. Um, they frequently have a club foot that is a deformity of the, of the feet and other um, joints. And, and really, this is a time where you really need a, a very uh, multidisciplinary team that include, obviously, neuromuscular with expertise in the disease, a geneticist to really confirm the diagnosis, uh, an obstetrician bef awfully before delivery if the mother was actually already diagnosed, and then a neonatologist to really care for this baby. And congenital myotonic dystrophy, the course is really dictated by how the baby does in the first year, okay? Um, if they are actually dependent on a breeding machine, what we call a breeding machine or having a, a ventilator in those first few months, that usually um, uh, imply a, a more severe form of the disease. Um, there are some babies that are so severe that will never be able to breed on their own, and so they will live with a, with a, vent, with, with a breeding machine and a trach. Uh, but they, if they do survive the first year with the support in a neuro ICU and with breeding support, the fascinating, interesting, and important thing that needs to be stressed with this family that now have this new diagnosis is that this uh, children will improve. They will improve for about 10 years. So although their start in life can be quite dramatically and they can be very, very sick, 
if they are supported and they survive the first year, then what we see, it's, it's a decade, about 10 years of very slow but continued improvement in their motor skills. And so that some of these babies might not be able to start walking at 12 months, they might be able to start walking at 24 months, for example. So, um, uh, and they really need to be supported by a, a team of people that really know about this particular form of the disease. The other thing that is not only motor delay, right? So sitting, walking, very, very delayed, um, they're very weak, but there is also um, speech and language delay. So their language can be very late, or if their language is intact, they know what they wanna say, but their speech is very, very impaired because they have uh, muscle weakness. Um, and then they have a spectrum of cognitive disorders like autistic, autistic spectrum, learning disability. And it's very, very interesting because by now you might have got the flavor of myotonic dystrophy. Myotonic dystrophy is such a multi um, faceted disease, and we try to fit the symptoms of myotonic dystrophy in other diagnoses. Say, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome, or you have sleep apnea, you have narcolepsy. But in reality, myotonic dystrophy manifestation and symptoms, they're so unique that it's very, very hard to put them in a particular um, basket. And this is particularly true in children. Um, but this is a list of some of the area that these children will be challenged with, uh, mobility and walking. Sometimes though, they can be very, very strong in their walking and in their legs, and they might have more problem with fine motor skills like riding and manipulating toys and objects. Remember, infancy is the time where we learn the most of how to deal with life, and so, um, these um, problems can really cause also delay in, in normal learning skills. Um, they can have uh, fatigue, impaired sleep, they can be very sleepy during the day, obviously that has major consequences in learning and school. They are frequently um, assumed that they're just lazy or that they might have very poor uh, sleeping um, hygiene at home. They have the myotonia, they have the gastrointestinal issues. Um, they have communication difficulties that is really very complex because it can be definitely language delay, like they really don't start talking until much later than compared to uh, normal children. But sometimes they know exactly what they want to say, but they cannot be understood because they have the facial muscle weakness, the tongue weakness, the myotonia, and that can become very frustrating. Um, they also have various degree of difficulty thinking and learning disability, the pulmonary issues, and then the choking and swallowing um, difficulties. Some of these babies actually that survive and came out of the neonatal ICU, they might come home with the feeding tube, and later on they do better and they improve, and they will be able to eat on, uh, by themselves. So again, um, there has been just uh, this month's uh, publication of consensus-based um, care recommendation for the children with myotonic dystrophy, for both the congenital and the childhood onset myotonic dystrophy. And this is not, this is a pretty impressive task because um, not having um, a reference, a, a kind of a map of how to deal with this very complex uh, childhood disease has been one of the most frustrating, uh, challenging things for this disease. And um, I think this is gonna be extremely helpful. Again, like other, as I have already said, this might not be recommendations that are based on <laughs> clinical trials or perfect research. We don't have perfect data. But these are experts that maybe they have treated hundreds of children with this disease for maybe 30 years, and they've put their mind and experience together and come up with the frame that makes sense. And one of the frustrating things about rare diseases is that patient, if you go to three different doctors, you might hear three different stories or recommendations. So one of the main goals of having some ref reference, some um, uh, guidelines is so that you can actually educate yourself, your family, your friends, um, and your own providers. Because remember, this is, after all, still a rare disease, although being the most common muscular dystrophy. So I don't want to go over the whole 
um, system, but I just want to give you some examples. So we have heard about um, how myotonic dystrophy patients have respiratory problems, right? Well, in children, respiratory problems, they can come in many different uh, flavors. It might be just that they have headaches in the morning and maybe their concentration is poor in school, okay? It's not exactly um, respiratory failure or sleep apnea. It can be quite subtle. And we really need to be astute when we um, try to help these children to succeed in school as much as possible. So having a very, very low threshold to have a sleep study in children can address many of the problems. It could be sleep apnea. It could be just that they have uh, not enough oxygen during the night, what we call hypoventilation. When we do a sleep study, we also like to do what, what is called um, a multiple sleep, sleep latency test. MSLT. And the fascinating about sleep disorders is that sometimes you can have a sleep study that is completely normal. You don't have sleep apnea. This is true for the adults too, but in the children as well. But when they ask you in a quiet room to take a nap, usually most people don't fall asleep in two minutes. It takes much longer. But these children, they can fall asleep very rapidly. And not only that, they go straight into REM sleep. And this can happen even when they had a very normal sleep study with not obvious uh, sleep apnea. So this is fascinating in many ways because really it's kind of unclassifiable in a way. You know, we have diseases like narcolepsy and many of these children do look a little bit like narcolepsy but not quiet. Some might have sleep apnea but they can also have, you know, the, the narcolepsy-like symptoms. So, bottom line is that you really need to have a very savvy sleep expert. Um, and you know, I usually recommend that probably someone that is, you know, sleep specialist come, they can be pulmonologists or they can be neurologists. So be aware of that, that probably this being a rare disease, probably you're better off with a sleep expert who's also a neurologist or with someone that have seen maybe more than 10 myotonic dystrophy rather than zero, just because it's quite, um, unique. And then you've heard uh, about some of these other uh, tests. And remember, the idea, especially with children, but obviously with the, all of our diseases, is to be proactive, not reactive. We don't want to wait for that pneumonia to happen to give the children a cough machine. We want to give them a cough machine even when they're very young and they might not need it so that we can keep them from having pneumonia, or if they do get pneumonia, to keep them out of the hospital and be treated at home. And that's really the very proactive pediatric approach to this type of complex diseases. Excessive daytime sleepiness is, um, I think I already told you quite a bit, but I think that for children, I put it very early, you know, before cardiac and all the other thing, because if you are sleeping and if you're falling asleep at school, you're missing out <laughs> all your learning opportunities. And having the guidelines that you can share with the teachers of your children to make them aware that, by the way, this is a child that might have these symptoms, these challenges, um, but is a child that can definitely learn, it just cannot stay awake because of this disease, and what are we going to do about it? So educate the teacher and, and, and uh, the people where they should learn from and make them aware. So this is a problem that really needs to be addressed, and usually it's not by, fixed by just one thing. It might not be just BiPAP at night. It might be a combination of BiPAP at night and maybe a stimulant during the day, and then maybe some habits of, yes, you take regular naps or having sleep hygiene. So in my experience, there is just one solution to daytime sleepiness. Um, it's usually a combination of, of different things that works best. The other thing that I put here very early is for children is really the, the vision and eye problems. So these children, they can have, um, low visual acuity, which obviously for learning at school is very, very um, um, important to um, assess that. They can also have the cataracts, they can have strabismus, which is sometimes due to the myotonia in the muscle eye. So the muscle that move your eyeballs can actually get the myotonia and give strabismus. So get them to an ophthalmology, to an eye doctor early is extremely important because you don't want to miss on their vision ability um, for school. And then they have, they can have the droopy eyelids. So they may or may not be sleepy at school, 
but people might interpret that they're sleepy all the time because their eyes are drooping. In fact, they're very awake, but they just look like they're sleepy. And so that needs to also be explained and addressed. And then speech, we already talked about that. That's very important because um, obviously children need to communicate their needs, but they need to communicate for fun. And this um, has been studied, and it's usually the speech problems are very complex. Again, again, this is myotonic dystrophy. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of myotonia, reduced lip force. They're not able to really move their lips normally. And then the muscle weakness that affects the face. So the speech can become very, very challenging. Usually, you know, people look at the parents who kind of translate what their children are saying. Parents are always way more, you know. Um, but you really need to find a very savvy speech therapist that can wor work with these children and, and find um, alternative ways of communicating. Many of these children early on, they will just sign and, and, um, and um, use that as a strategy. The, the, the GI symptoms, again, um, can be very, very um, uh, challenging in the children as well. And this, in the guidelines, you will find some of the recommendation. The bottom line is that sometimes, you know, mexilitin is also used to treat the GI, the, the diarrhea and the constipation. You only have to be careful, you know, and have a cardiac evaluation. But, you know, again, we sometimes like to call it the um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, just because we don't know what to call it. They're just such a unique set of symptoms um, that we just try to um, say, well, it, it's similar to IBS. So, and obviously the interesting thing is that you will come to your neuromuscular neurologist expert in myotonia with problems that really, we are not really trained to, um, to treat diarrhea or constipation. Yeah, we understand that that's part of your disease. And if we are effective, we will send you to a GI and try to educate the uh, GI especially to say, by the way, this is really a little bit different than your regular IBS and we'll have kind of a team um, working with your particular problem. Cardiac is usually not a common problem early in life in these children, so we do like to have them screen at diagnosis, but usually that um, comes much later. And remember, sometimes children who say they have pain, chest pain, it might not be from the heart, but it might be the myotonia in the chest uh, muscles, um, and maxillitin can help with that. Psychosocial management is probably one of the most challenging and more important, especially in, in the children again. And it really has to do with access to appropriate psychological and therapy services that usually uh, come through the school, obviously. And really, um, the goal is to try to modify the activity to in, including social engagement so that the children can actually avoid um, being isolated from friends and community events and to really grow their own confidence and esteem. And you can look in the guidelines. This is just an example on the left of the different symptoms that affect different intellectual ability, executive function, down to dyslexia. And on the side, you will find some suggestions, some approaches. So I'm not going to go through the whole list, but it's very, very important that this is a point of reference. We're very lucky here in Rochester we have a major um, center of research and clinical care for autism. And I have to say, again, that frequently these children are um, classified as autistic spectrum or autistic. And in my experience, although they do express some symptoms that are seen in autism, they're very, very different. I have to say that some of the best hugs I've ever received, and I see a lot of children in my practice, they have been the hugs from children with congenital myotonic dystrophy. So these are children that are, they like to hug, they like to snuggle, they're very friendly and open, and they wanna you know, express themselves. They just need the tools to do so, um, given their challenges. The other thing that I found in terms of engagement of what they can do is that they might not be the best kids in the PE class. That's a big problem. Um, but um, they might enjoy immensely doing, for example, ballet or yoga. I have kids that come and they show me all their postures with yoga and dancing and music. Music therapy is huge with these um, kids and sometimes even horse therapy. 
So you have to be creative to just get them out and about and express uh, the best that they can be. Um, we have already reviewed this, so I'm not going to um, pause on this very much, but obviously for children that undergo procedure, please have them uh, share these guidelines with their anesthesiologist and probably have uh, see a pulmonologist um, before um, undergoing any surgery or anesthesia. So ultimately, um, guidelines, why are they important to you and how you should use them? Well, first of all, I think that any patient, any family with a challenging disease, the more informed you are and educated about a rare disease, the better off you are advocating for yourself and for your children and to seek out the expertise that you need. Also, it's a tool that when people ask you questions, especially teachers, friends, other family members, you can try to explain or you can give them reading material and they can think about it because people do want to help. I see that especially in family with children, you know, frequently the grandparents are going to step in, the unaffected parent is going to become, you know, primary caregiver for many tasks like driving around and so forth. So the more education and really to look and have a map and say, okay, where do I need to focus my attention? What kind of providers do I need to seek out for my child? And then uh, ultimately to advocate for services at school, that's very, very important. And we should be our advocate to coordinate all these type of things for school, certainly, but also at work. I have myotonic dystrophy young uh, patients that were brilliant and very, very smart, but they couldn't stay awake in college. And uh, I had mothers who will go at 6 a.m. and start with the process of waking them up to get them to class. And between Adderall and Provigil and the mother, they made it through college. So it's, um, I have seen many, many different strategies, but I think that uh, explaining to the, uh, to the community what kind of symptoms and challenge it will serve you best. So that's how these guidelines can be helpful. So I think that's all I have, and um, I guess we're all gonna take questions.